When I first learned of Taoism, I understood it to be a philosophy. When I learned of Taoist religious practices, I understood Taoism to refer to either the philosophy or the religion. When I learned of the new perspective of Taoism as a complex religion, I was unsure how to understand Taoism. And I doubt that I've been the only one to question Taoism's place. For decades, Taoism in the West has been interpreted to be twofold, constituted of a philosophical form and a religious form. But recently, this understanding has come under fire, as modern academics suggest that no such line can be drawn. As it stands, Taoism is divided as scholars talk past, criticize, and ignore each other in a debate with the future of the study of Taoism on the line. Today, in order to understand what Taoism really is, I intend to explore the divergent opinions and establish a productive stance towards the study of Taoism. This may be a long video, so I've left some timestamps in the description below, as well as a list of sources I used in the creation of this video. Taoist philosophy in the West is not hard to come by, whether it's through the popular lectures of Alan Watts, best-selling books like The Secret of the Golden Flower, The Tao of Physics, or The Tao of Pu, or a rare university course of classical Chinese philosophy. Taoism, in the sense, is typically introduced as an ancient Chinese wisdom. Comprising this study of Taoism are the ontological, ethical, or otherwise philosophical meanings of the classical texts, the Lao Tzu, also known as the Tao Te Ching, and Zhuangzi, along with their concepts of Wu Wei, Tao, Zitran, and others. Oftentimes, these analyses are understood in light of the modern Western predicament and offer a form of philosophical therapy, hence the mentioning of these ideas in the occasional self-help book. And for many, the positive effects of the introduction of Taoist philosophy into their lives cannot be overstated, as it offers an alternative perspective that is quite distinct from that of most today. While the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi comprise much of this Taoist philosophy, it must be understood that the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi that are available to us today are not the totality of Taoism. If for no other reason than the undeniable fact that these texts were not directly handed to us and explained to us by their original authors. The books have been added to, edited, taught, studied, commented on, and translated before reaching us today. With an understanding that Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi do not comprise all that is Taoism, the vision of study expands. Just as it did in the history of the Western study of Taoism, James Liege had translated these two classics. Future scholars, following the reprinting of the Taoist canon, studied the organized communities of Taoists. However, in response to this, there was the establishment of a rigid distinction between two types of Taoism, philosophical and religious. By the 1950s, growing research on organized Taoist religion forced Western scholars to acknowledge that there was Taoism beyond the classics. As a result, a distinction was pointed out or fabricated depending on your standpoint. This was the bifurcation of Taoism into at least two distinct branches. One, a philosophy based on the works of the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, and the other, a religion based on superstitious practices like alchemy and talismans. In the following years, Western scholars of Taoism adopted the distinction. A.C. Graham introduces the Lietze, stating that the text is the third of the great philosophical Taoist classics. Alan Watts references the distinction in his text, Tao, the Watercourse Way, stating that his interest is more so in philosophical Taoism as opposed to religious Taoism, and he states, I do not know enough of the latter to explain it coherently or judge it fairly. Watts, Graham, and a number of other scholars reference one particular person when they mention the distinction. Hurley Glessner Creel, a scholar of Chinese philosophy and early Chinese history at the University of Chicago, with specific interest in Confucianism, Legalism, and Taoism. In 1956, Creel published an essay titled, What is Taoism? wherein he laid out the argument for a two-sided Taoism. Creel's paper argued in favor of the distinction, but beyond that, that these two Taoisms, philosophical and religious, were separate and distinct. For Creel, philosophical Taoism consisted of the Lao Tzu, Lietze, Huai Nanzi, and Wang Bi's commentary, along with subsequent philosophical developments. But at the core of philosophical Taoism, Creel believes stands the Zhuangzi as our finest exposition of Taoist thinking. 
Creel, when discussing what is usually said to be religious Taoism, instead uses the term Xian Taoism because of the ambiguity of the former. Xian here is a Chinese word for immortal or immortality, and is what Creel believes to be what holds all of this Taoist tradition together. Xian Taoists relied on asceticism, sexual practices, magic, and talismans. Creel concludes his introduction of the distinction by stating, the differences between Xian Taoism and philosophic Taoism are striking to say the least. Given that Creel holds that the distinction was true of Taoism since the beginning, as they were wholly separate traditions, the distinction and his subsequent historical analysis go hand in hand. Creel first addresses the early history of Taoism through analyzing the view of two other scholars, Kuo Mojo and Henry Maspero. Mojo held the general belief of scholars of the time that Taoist philosophy gradually took into itself indigenous practices and superstitions, absorbed much from Buddhism, and was transformed into Xi'an Taoism. This is the view that the so-called original philosophical Taoism degenerated into religious Taoism through the inclusion of folk religion and Buddhism. This position is now the most frequently criticized and rejected by the new perspective, as I will address in the next section. Creel finds this history untenable, for the reason that it suggests that the two traditions were not distinct, but that religious Taoism was a development of philosophical Taoism. The next scholar, Henry Maspero, held Mojo's view as superficial, and can also now be labeled as a predecessor of the new perspective. Maspero wrote that the texts often attributed as a source of Taoism, the Lao Tzu, Zhuangzi, and Lietze, only represented a small circle with mystical and philosophical leanings. They were learned letters, which transformed the often crude teachings of the sect into philosophy. Thus, it is not that philosophical Taoism was the root of Xi'an Taoism, but rather that both represented branches of Taoism as it was at the time. Ultimately, Creel finds Maspero's explanation unsatisfactory due to the downplaying of the differences between philosophical and Xi'an Taoisms. Creel then sets out to prove that philosophic Taoism and Xi'an Taoism not only were never identical, their associations even have been minimal. Creel's history of separate Taoisms is as follows. The Lao Tzu, at the beginning of the history, was too ambiguous to deny either side of the distinction. Therefore, it holds a lonely place, being in both traditions, which one depends on your interpretation. The Zhuangzi, also at the beginning, was the text of philosophical Taoism. Despite the claims of Xi'an Taoists that the text advocated the search for immortality, Creel holds that it stood in clear contrast with the cult of immortality, particularly because time after time, we are told that for the enlightened Taoist, both death and life are matters of indifference. This is the view that I explored in my second ever video, Death in the Tao, Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi. But due to Creel's claim that the Zhuangzi cannot be a text of early Xi'an Taoism, he is forced to dive deeper into the text. Creel references a number of examples from the text that support his own reading, that the Zhuangzi advocates for an indifference towards death, but what follows from Creel beyond that is frankly disappointing from an academic standpoint. He writes, A few of the passages that have been collected into the Zhuangzi probably show direct influence from the immortality cult, but most of the evidence on which the Zhuangzi has been alleged to espouse the search for immortality depends upon rather elaborate interpretation. Instead of acknowledging or refuting these examples and elaborate interpretations, Creel begins a short discussion on Taoism as mysticism, as though he changed the topic to avoid having to explore the counterexamples at full length. Then, returning to the Zhuangzi, Creel speaks of only one such counterexample, that being the one direct reference to Xi'an within the Zhuangzi. The passage conflicts with Creel's conception of the Zhuangzi's stance on death by speaking well of the immortal. Creel deems this passage an interpolation, writing, It not only conflicts with the philosophy of the Zhuangzi, but in several details, coincides exactly with later Xi'an Taoist tenets. Here, Creel has used circular reasoning to support his dismissal of the passage, since both of Creel's arguments include a premise that is the conclusion of the other. Now, it may indeed be the case that the advocacy for indifference outweighs the advocacy for immortality throughout the entirety of the text. However, this is not the same as saying that the Singular philosophy of the Zhuangzi is an indifference towards death. In his analysis of the Zhuangzi, 
Creel has failed to provide a valid argument for his dismissal of the one counterexample he acknowledged, while ignoring the rest with the goal of concretely classifying it as a text of philosophical Taoism and not Xian Taoism. Thus, while Creel should like to see the Zhuangzi as only a text of philosophical Taoism, Creel's analysis of the Zhuangzi cannot be taken as definitive of the text as a whole, and the placement of the Zhuangzi as a solely philosophical text would require further analysis. Roughly around 300 BCE, both philosophical Taoism and Xian Taoism, which Creel describes at this point was but only a cult of immortality, developed near to each other, but distinctly. The roots of the cult of immortality are to be found in the work of shamans and magicians. Citing the historical records, Creel describes Su Yen, a philosopher of the naturalist school, as one such magician. In the third century, philosophical Taoism and the cult of immortality lacked association. The second century BCE text, the Huainansa, would speak on Taoism with no mention to immortality, strictly as a philosophy. And the historian Simakian, in his history, wrote on both Taoism and immortality, but not together. Not mentioned by Creel, but relevant here. The Shiji suggests that only later on did Taoism take a primarily religious form. From Emperor Qing's reign on, though Taoism continued to flourish as a semi-religious cult among the people, it dropped out of sight in discussions of the philosophy of rule. And it is clear that by the time of the first century CE text, the Lunhang, the label of Taoism, was inextricably linked to immortality. Creel's explanation for this is that the cult of immortality, with its alchemy, magic, and sexual techniques, was looked down upon. Thus, in order to change their popular view, the immortality cult needed the shelter of a respected philosophy. In taking advantage of the ambiguity of the Lao Tzu, they found shelter under the name of the well-respected Taoism. Thus, Xian Taoism was created. Creel acknowledges the Lietze as the third and last of the major philosophical Taoist texts. The text is made into the form it is known as today, sometime between the former Han dynasty and Zhang Zhan's commentary. The well-known Confucius is referenced throughout the Lietze and almost always spoken fondly of. This leads Creel to assert that, by the time the Lietze was written, philosophical Taoism no longer found its rival in Confucianism, but instead in Xian Taoism. His primary example being found in the Lietze's Yang Chu chapter, a chapter that is likely to include the works of an unknown hedonist author. According to Creel, from the Zhuangzi, Xian Taoist held Yang Shen to be advocacy for immortality. This story from the Lietze, I believe, undeniably rejects such a view of Yang Shen in saying, Yenza asked Quan Cheng about tending life. Quan Cheng answered, It is simply living without restraint. Do not suppress, do not restrict. All these restrictions are oppressive masters. If you can rid yourself of these oppressive masters and wait serenely for death, whether you last a day, a month, a year, or ten years, it will be what I call tending life. Now, if you would like to know further about the ideas within the Lietze, feel free to check out the video I made on it. Creel holds that Ge Hong represented Xi'an Taoism during his time. Hong, with his primary interest in immortality, criticized the Tao Te Ching for being too vague, and the Zhuangzi for reasons far harsher, saying that the text says that life and death are just the same, brands the effort to preserve life as laborious servitude, and praises death as a rest. This doctrine is separated by millions of miles from that of spirits and immortals. Finally, two of the earliest and most well-known commentaries on the Lao Tzu display the two distinct types of Taoism, philosophical in Wang Bi's commentary, and Xian Taoism in the Heshing Gong commentary. Creel goes on to say that the representatives of the two opposing Taoisms can be found at any subsequent period, suggesting that one such representative of philosophical Taoism is Chan and later Zen philosophy. And Creel clearly holds himself to be the continuation of the philosophical Taoist tradition. Creel concluded his paper with a criticism of religious Taoism, saying that there is one element that we might expect to find which is completely absent from Xian Taoism. That is the central insight of philosophical Taoism. If it has not already become apparent, Creel has a clear bias towards the study of his philosophical Taoism and appears to want to distance that study from religious Taoism. This is common amongst those who uphold the distinction. It is not rare to see comments on the distinction such as one's a philosophy, 
the other is pseudoscience. Thus, for many, the distinction separates the pure ideas of the Laozi and Zhuangzi from the superstition and magic of the Xi'an Daoists. Of course, it is not so simple as to say that only philosophers hold the distinction. A scholar of religion at UC Boulder, Terry K. Kleeman, in a New York Times piece titled Reconstructing Daoism's Transformation in China, reified this distinction. Thus far, I have not mentioned another common reference for the distinction, and that is the two Chinese characters, Dao Jia and Dao Jiao. In a recent video, the wonderful YouTuber George Thompson and his teacher mentioned this distinction and their pronunciation. And many claim that the two words are proof of the existence of the distinction within the Chinese study of Taoism for centuries. In, in Chinese language, when we say Taoism, if you think of philosophy, we say Dao Jia. Dao Jia. And if it's religion, we say Dao Jiao. Dao Jiao. Dao Jiao. So Dao Jiao is more really, really uh, religious while Dao Jia can be re philosophy and uh, religion. Okay. Yeah. Throughout the course of the 20th century, the distinction articulated above between philosophical Taoism and religious Taoism declined in popularity in favor of a new perspective. Today, many people, particularly scholars of religious studies, believe that this distinction between philosophical Taoism and religious Taoism is one of, if not the, greatest misunderstandings of Taoism. Russell Kirkland articulates the critique of the distinction by the new perspective, saying that such artificial bifurcations do not do real justice to the facts and serve little heuristic purpose. Kirkland, Levi Cohen, and others hold that Creel's reductionist view of Taoism as two entirely separate traditions does not accurately reflect the more complex reality. Instead, Taoism is better understood as a hybrid religious tradition with diverse and continually evolving doctrines and institutional forms. There has been an unreal amount of research in the years since Creel's essay, so here I will begin with a new perspective as it conflicts with Creel. Taoism is commonly understood to have originated with Lao Tzu, but in the academic study of Taoism, those of the new perspective suggest other beginnings, such as Barrett when he says, I would suggest that the tendency of many scholars, and notably the late Anna Seidel, to start in the second century CE has much to recommend it. Thus, the new perspective takes the beginning of organized Taoist religion to mark the official beginning of Taoism. However, I must be quick to say, as Barrett does, that this does not preclude a discussion of the earlier phenomena. Indeed, it demands it. It is through the eyes of the first established significant groups of dedicated Taoists that the new perspective examines the pre-Han era. Now, for those who have long held the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi as a central and foundational text of Taoism, this may appear absurd so the point requires further explanation. During the time when the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi were compiled, philosophy was rapidly increasing across China. Throughout these philosophies, the mention of Tao or Wei was common, as visible in the works of the Confucians. This Tao was often not the same Tao as most understand it today in the Taoist context. Instead, Tao referred to each competing philosophy's specific way, and so the usage of the term Tao was not entirely unique to just the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi. And in neither the Lao Tzu nor the Zhuangzi is there the inclusion of the label Taoism, nor a Taoist movement. The label of Taoism would not be applied specifically to the teachings of these texts for centuries. To borrow Barrett's words, the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi are not to be seen as an established tradition itself shaping the future, but rather a heritage to be shaped. Thus, despite how they are commonly categorized today, Neither the Lao Tzu nor the Zhuangzi is specifically or exclusively Taoist. But, once again, this does not mean that among the study of Taoism, they do not require investigation. Instead, they are to be studied without a view that the two are entirely cohesive with or reflective of all of Taoism. The two texts, along with a number of others, may be better understood as the foundation upon which organized Taoism began. Among these texts, but not among those addressed by Creel, stands the Neya, or inward training. The Neya is Taoist in orientation, echoing the ideas of Lao Tzu, Zhuangzi, and Huainanzi. With a focus on the nature of Tao, the text included self-cultivation techniques, like breathing meditation, the fundamental purpose of which was to achieve reunion with Tao 
The text is a Taoist classic that includes religious practices that would be practiced by later Taoists. Returning to Creel, he blames the naturalist philosopher Su Yen for the popularization of alchemical practices in pursuit of immortality. Such an interpretation of Su Yen has fallen out of favor among academics, such as Nathan Sivan, who found no substantive evidence that the philosopher taught any alchemical practices in search of immortality. And Gahong, who Creel and others pointed to as the exemplar of religious Taoism, was an aristocratic scholar official who received some Taoist training and went on to pursue alchemical immortality. However, he should not be interpreted as exclusively Taoist, but instead as an example of the religious landscape of South China before the organized Taoist religion, known as the Celestial Masters, arrived. Creel, in his analysis, suggested that the Lao Tzu commentary by Wang Bi and the Lietzu were the continuation of philosophical Taoism. Here, I may refer to my video on Wang Bi's commentary, where I said, Wang Bi was the second of the Xuan Shui philosophers. These scholars of the mysterious comprised a post-classical Chinese philosophy, popular from roughly 200 to 500 Common Era. They are often labeled as Neo-Daoists, but such a label can be misleading. More accurately, they were Confucian scholars who wanted to reinterpret Confucian theory to be compatible with the I Ching, or the Book of Changes, the Lao Tzu, and the Zhuangzi. The Xuanshui philosophers, including Wang Bi, Zhang Zhan, and Guo Jiang, were deeply rooted in Confucianism. Wang Bi wrote the commentary on the Lao Tzu. Zhang Zhan wrote a commentary on the Lietzi and may have written the text himself. And Guo Jiang wrote a commentary on the Zhuangzi as well as revising it from its original 52 chapters to the 33 that we know it for today, removing sections that were not to his philosophical liking. Creel would place all three of these philosophers within his philosophical Taoism tradition, but their work may be better understood as Confucian reconstruction of the Lao Zhuang texts. In the prior section, I mentioned how Creel and others point to the Chinese words Dao Jia and Dao Jiao to reinforce the credibility of the philosophy-religion distinction. To refute this, I'll refer to Robson, in Shiji, the term Daojia first appeared as the name of an early philosophical tradition or lineage, described there as a syncretic movement. Later in the Han Dynasty, it was simply one of the bibliographic categories into which the texts in the imperial library were sorted. It came to include the writings of Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, along with other works that presented alternatives to the Confucian system of social and political structuring. Similarly, the term Daojiao initially had nothing to do with the Taoist religion, which it predated. During the pre-Han period, it was applied to a variety of philosophical traditions, including Confucianism, and from about the 3rd to the 5th century CE, the term was even used as a synonym for Buddhism. Nevertheless, at some point in the 5th century, Dao Jiao became identified solely with organized Taoism, as distinguished from Buddhism. As it stands, if history is as a new perspective would suggest, Creel's rigid distinction stands on little historical proof but there's even more to the New Perspective's historical analysis. On top of the New Perspective's new view of the early history of Taoism, they include a critical history of Taoism as it has been studied by the West, a topic which is often absent from Taoism's history. The study of Chinese history by the West had largely begun with the arrival of Western missionaries in the 16th century. When it comes to Taoism, Matteo Ricci was the most influential of these Jesuit scholars. Ricci allied himself with Confucian scholar officials and criticized the practices of the Taoists and Buddhists as idolatrous and superstitious. In his description of the Taoists, Ricci wrote, They buy in their disciples and are as low and dishonest a class as those already described, those already described being the Buddhists. It became the attitude of the Jesuit study of Chinese history that Confucianism was the Chinese philosophy while Taoism was just a superstitious cult among the public. This view influenced Enlightenment thinkers like Kant, Locke, Voltaire, and Leibniz to develop a deep scorn for Taoist religious practices and an admiration of Confucianism. At this time, the philosophy versus religion dichotomy had placed Confucianism in the former and Taoism and Buddhism in the latter. For the following years, Taoism in the West was largely discarded. James Liege was the next significant figure in the study of Taoism in the West. Liege went against the influence of Confucians and Catholics in his study of the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi. However, his conception was based on the Confucian curriculum and was without information from trained Taoists. In Liege's translation of the Tao Te Ching, he set the content of that work 
against later Taoist religious practices, which he called polluted by ritual and superstition. Thus, the popular distinction of philosophical and religious Taoism had begun to take shape. From then on, Western scholars of Taoism would study the texts while giving little interest in contemporary Taoist organizations, dismissing them as something entirely separate. On top of this, influences on Taoism in the recent century have forced it to take on a less ritualistic and more philosophical form. I speak more at length on this in my video, Taoism A Brief History, but it should come as no surprise that the Republican government of China had given Taoism no choice but to fit within the Western idea of religion only for that to be entirely stripped away by the anti-religious government led by Mao. For this reason, Kirkland suggests that it should be no wonder that after organized Taoism had been marginalized by Confucians in power for centuries and communists in power for decades, Taoism had been long dismissed as a hodgepodge of specious products of scoundrels and fools. This critical history demonstrates why the new perspective sees Creel's view as a misunderstanding. Returning specifically to the Western study of Taoism, when Confucian leaders who were not fond of Taoism and Catholic missionaries who disparaged anything that posed a threat to their faith worked together during early Sinology, the Western understanding of Taoism could not help being deeply distorted. This was the origin of the old perspective, that held by Creel. However, it is not the totality of the Western study of Taoism, for over the course of the last century, the new perspective has come into fruition. Describing the old and new perspectives, Kirkland wrote, 20th century scholarship developed two divergent frameworks. First, that of mainstream scholars, trained to understand Taoism in terms of the deeply distorted Victorian Confucian construct. And second, that of scholars who accepted the importance of the Taozong, such as Chen Gofu and Henry Maspero, as well as various Japanese scholars who had been less directly affected by the Orientalist perspectives that dominated Western Sinology. The Taozong is the Taoist Canon, a compilation of significant Taoist texts, including original classics, commentaries, rituals, lineages, biographies, and more. There have only been a handful of these original canons, with the first possibly compiled around the year 400 Common Era, and the last in the year 1445 during the Ming Dynasty. This Ming edition has been largely kept locked away in temple libraries, that is, until the photolithographic reproduction of them was published by the commercial press in Shanghai in 1926. While this flew under the radar of Western scholars, not all were blind to the text's importance. It was Henry Maspero, who Creel had chastised, that would dive into this reprint of the canon and essentially begin the new perspective study of Taoism. Years later, Christopher Schipper would complete the study of the canon, and by then, the new perspective would take off. Not only is there now extensive research on the tradition of organized Taoism, but research on the contemporary forms of Taoism, particularly two forms, which are to be found each in northern and southern China. Looking back at the history of Taoism study in the West, the new perspective demands that we must, first, recognize the Chineseness of Taoism, second, privilege the factual data of Taoism itself in social, historical, and textual terms, and third, acknowledge the importance of the living forms of Taoism that survive among Chinese communities today. This perspective clearly conflicts with the aforementioned perspective. With the still massively popular old perspective and growing new perspective diametrically opposed, the study of Taoism as we know it is deeply divided. Now that I've presented my research at length with minimal commentary, and in doing so, I hope that I've done justice to both sides, I'd like to share my thoughts on the matter. This division, I believe, poses a great threat to the study of Taoism. If it has not already been made clear, the two sides appear to conflict in nearly every aspect. At times, there has been claimed a dialogue between the two sides. However, this is rarely the case. Instead, each side lambasts the other with criticism and sticks alongside the scholars that hold their opinion. Thus, most scholars of Taoism strongly hold to their own side, forcing newcomers to the study to pick a side. Or, when newcomers aren't aware of the distinction already, they may unknowingly adopt the position they are first introduced to. There's a story I had heard about a university class which was specifically offered on Taoism. On the very first day of class, the room was packed to the brim. The same day, in introducing Taoism, the professor charged adamantly that Taoism is not some go-with-the-flow, ride-the-waves, hippie philosophy. It's a religion. Then, a couple days later, when the next class rolled around, only three students remained. Along these same lines, 
the new perspective has held the popular understanding of Taoism to be so misguided that it is akin to suggesting that Plato and Aristotle were the founders of Christianity. For those within the new perspective, it may appear that the distinction has been nullified and Taoism no longer bifurcated. However, in their absolute rejection of the popular Western understanding of Taoism, I do not see the solution to the distinction, but rather the reinforcement of it. The new perspective holds Taoism to be a complex religion, distinguishing themselves from the old perspective. And thus, if one is to continue Creel's analysis, it would be easy to describe the new perspective as the study of Xi'an or religious Taoism, as opposed to Creel and Graham's study of philosophical Taoism. In fact, the new perspective puts so much distance between themselves and the old perspective that they see the two as entirely separate studies as Kirkland had. The new perspective, in asserting their own religious understanding and rejecting the old philosophical understanding, appears to actually reify the distinction. The only difference between the old and new perspectives being that, in the old perspective, philosophy had been seen as true Taoism, while in the new perspective, now religion is seen as true Taoism. Thus, it is not only that each side rejects the understanding of the other, but that each side simply does not believe the other to be worthy of study. And this is why the division is so harmful to the overall study of Taoism. I believe that there exists the possibility for genuine unity within the study of Taoism. However, it will require the casting away of harsh prejudice and acknowledgement of value within the opposing study. First, it will require a broader understanding of what is contained under the umbrella term of Taoism. Borrowing from a Leviah Cohen, regardless of period and working definition, the study of Taoism so far can be described as having been approached from four major angles, philosophy, history and literature, ritual, and practices and techniques. It is crucial to understand that none of these are Taoism alone, but each a component. But beyond these four major approaches, there are two further determining factors in describing which Taoism someone is studying. The first of these two is the subject, whether it's a text, idea, or period of time. Examples would include the Lao Tzu or lightning rituals. On top of the approach and the subject, one must acknowledge the lens through which they are studying, possibly a particular Taoist school or an opposing system of thought, like Confucianism. I must note that within any study, a lens exists, whether explicit or not. With this description of what constitutes a particular study of Taoism, I can now speak on its effects on the two perspectives. First, the new perspective can no longer ignore the popular understanding of Taoism in the West as a life philosophy. Robson, of the new perspective, has written on the popular Western Taoist texts, such as the Tao of Pu, that it would be easy to dismiss these, and many of his colleagues have. However, adding on to this, he states, these trends are not simply modern transformations of Taoism that arose out of nowhere. While I believe Robson's intention here was to point to the historical influences that have led to the misunderstanding of Taoism, I believe it also suggests something else. Taoism, like any other tradition, has changed and evolved over time. Certainly, the new perspective may know this of Taoism better than the old perspective. At each point in time, the religion survives so long as it is offering answers to the religious questions posed at the time. I believe it may be the innate selfish desire for one to answer the philosophical questions they are presented with in their own personal context. And at this specific point in time, for the modern West, the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi have been seen as the most applicable to answer today's religious questions. This is why I spoke in one of the first sections on the positive influence that Taoism as a philosophy has had on countless people. This, I believe, is overlooked by a new perspective which is so intent on studying Taoism as it had answered the religious questions of the past that they reject the value within studying Taoism for one's own sake to answer today's religious questions. If this value can be recognized by the new perspective, then there opens the opportunity of the new perspective supplying centuries of Taoist ideas to influence the personal study of Taoism from the perspective of today. And there is room for the recognition of popular Western Taoism if one is to adopt the threefold placement articulated a minute ago. For the most part, the ideas of Creel and colleagues can be understood as a study of the philosophy of the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi through the lens of the modern Westerner. With such an interpretation, it is clear that this study is only a small part of a vast greater religion, but a part nonetheless, no longer needed to be cast aside. The old perspective cannot ignore the wealth of information that has been supplied by the new perspective, 
to take the Laozi and Zhuangzi as the only Taoist texts of significance is undoubtedly reductionist. The new perspective has done an outstanding job bringing to light the realities of all aspects of Taoism. Thus, what is required of the old perspective is the acknowledgement of the value of Taoism far beyond that which Creel has deemed philosophical Taoism. Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to dive into the study of Taoist rituals. In fact, I don't even mean to assert that you must shift your subject and lens of Taoist study. After all, a couple videos of mine are on the two classics from the modern perspective. But the old perspective must see that philosophy only comprises one of the four approaches to the study of Taoism, and the Laozi and Zhuangzi as just two of the countless subjects of the study of Taoism. The study of the philosophy of Taoism can and must be continued, but beyond the reductionist view of Creel. Instead as the study of the ancient texts, Laozi and Zhuangzi, and their commentaries, as well as the analysis of later Taoist texts from the viewpoint of philosophy or comparative mysticism. Too often is the former well studied and the latter ignored. Kirkland, in describing the latter, says, Further attention is due to the rich diversity of Taoist conceptions of the religious life. Virtually no one outside the immediate field today knows, for instance, that Tong Taoists wrote extensively about Tao nature, the true reality of all things, including ourselves. Nor do most realize that much of the Quan Chen thought actually parallels and interacted historically with the thought of Chan Buddhism and with many elements of Neo-Confucian thought and practice. To explain that Taoist practice was often taught and practiced in terms of cultivating the heart-mind or in terms of integrating our inherent nature with our destined lives will correct and greatly expand the very narrow and misleading depictions of Taoist thought or Taoist practice that characterized most modern presentations. A greater range of information can only be seen as a success for the study of Taoist philosophy. And thus, I believe that both sides can benefit greatly from the simple recognition of the value of the other. In doing so, they would not only benefit separately, but grow together. The study of Taoism has long been divided, but I believe that if its multifaceted value is acknowledged, the study of Taoism can become unified and greater than ever before. Now that's all I've got to talk about today. This is undoubtedly a complex topic, that this video has not covered in its entirety. So if you have any thoughts, feel free to leave them below. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe, and check out another video. And until next time.